This is Runehammer. In the final days of the Vietnam War, as the North Vietnamese Army moved into the South, the greatest deception in American and world intelligence history was executed. The concealment of an alien force which had swayed the course of that endless conflict. To battle this new front, a crack squad of special commandos was assigned. They were called Grave Wind. In a desperate effort to fight back the alien menace, they had only one chance, a final strike, unknown to the outside world, but they needed one piece of equipment to execute their impossible mission. Is that it, Sarge? Is that what they've been talking about? Looks like it. It's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. Let's take a look. What the hell is that? i never seen a computer like that. That's an RPG mainframe, son and it's gonna save the human race. Greetings programs, it's old Hanker and Furnail back once again on Runehammer, how to play D&D like a big old badass. That's what I'm going to do, and that's what you're going to do, and that's why you're here. Welcome back to RPG Mainframe. It's episode 15. Can you believe that? How weird is that? Okay, I got three topics today that I wanted to just jump into for the mainframe. You know how we do it. It's all about thinking how to get better at thinking when it comes to your RPG. So the three things I wanted to cover today, one is adventure inversion, and another is the dramatic question which is just a follow-up discussion on uh, my interview with the Arcane Library last week. And then finally, we wanted to talk a little bit about dump statting and um, also how to use statting as an adventure design tool. And, uh, you know, depending if this is kind of uh, feeling productive, feeling smart, feeling interesting, um, these little guys might become videos as well eventually. But uh, right now, it's just time to get into the RPG mainframe. So... Let's just dive right in, shall we? And let's do them in the opposite order, just to illustrate the point of adventure inversion. So we're going to start with dump statting. Now, this idea came up from the illustrious Matt Shaker, um, but there's a little more to it than maybe just the initial question was kind of like, how do you get these dump stats to be interesting? Now, you guys know what dump stats are. Um, every character build out there has two or three really clutch stats that generally players are rolling a lot of the time, more than half the time. A dump stat is a statistic on their character that they don't spend resources or creation points or experience or whatever on because they just never use it and they, they've never had reason to use it and they just wind up with these dump stats, right? So a, a classic example is the super effective fighter and everyone sort of starts to forget that he has like a six intelligence, you know, like an <laughs> IE extremely low intelligence plus six would be huge in ICRPG. But you get my meaning is that he never does intelligence roles. So he didn't put any investment into intelligence and you just kind of brush it under the carpet. So there's a couple things at play to try to answer Matt's question here. And I would invite you to consider what the impact of these answers are for you. And if you have different answers, and honestly, if the issue itself is important to you, is, is another way to consider if this is something that could enhance your game or maybe something that you need to modify your game. Maybe you, instead of trying to resolve the dumb stat problem, you just want to remove dumb stats. Um, you know, if you're doing a more casual game or with, you know, absolute beginners, you might just want to have two stats. You know, which could be like, you know, melee and ranged, you know, like you could really bring things down or you could make it like magic and battle. Those could be your two stats. Um, so that would be another approach to the dump stat problem is just to eliminate stats that just are too nuanced or too detailed for some groups. But I'm going to proceed uh, presuming that um, we want to stick with our stat set and either make dump stats interesting or provide ways that players are compelled 
to invest in these stats. Okay, so let's consider those two options. And then I want to give you a sort of a wrap up. Okay, so firstly, Okay, so first let's take that fighter example. He has put all of his loot, his stat points, his XP, whatever resources he has to create his character into combat to make himself this juggernaut of war. And as a little uh, sort of brushed under the rug item, he has, you know, the intelligence of a chimpanzee. Okay, so this is going to drastically affect his ability to be a good tactical warrior, right? There's one thing that we all know about the, the finest warriors is that they're extremely intelligent. So how do you make this interesting? Well, first of all, don't let it get swept under the rug. Don't let this player forget their low stat. Now, no matter what the low stat is on any character, it doesn't have to be intelligence. A lot of people will, you know, come short on con or, you know, not put anything into charisma. You know, the sort of the softer stats. The first step is not to let them forget. So just remind them like, oh, well, you know, a normally intelligent person would have done this, but you just don't, you can't quite figure it out, right? Right. Or, you know, be sure to have it at the surface that they have this really low stat. They're going to want to sort of forget about it. This is like, you know, their weird relative that they would rather not come over. But you're going to invite the relative over and they're going to act weird at the table. And this is going to continually twist a little bit of a knife in them for this dump stat behavior. And hopefully when the time comes, you know, get them to invest rather than just leaving this skeleton in their closet. So that's the first piece is like to keep it at the surface. Now, the other one to do to make it interesting is actually to create an exchange system. And this is how GURPS did it. You use advantages and disadvantages. Taking disadvantages uh, gives you points to put into other things. So you could do this at creation. Now, how is this interesting? Well, you can give names to levels under normal. And this is also how GURPS did it. So... Let's say that you have a fighter who wants to go with subnormal intelligence in exchange for supernormal durability, okay? So he's kind of this lunk-headed dwarf, right, who really doesn't understand much. But dang it, he just don't bleed. Um, so what you do is that each point or each sort of tier under normal, the intelligence goes, you give it a sort of a name, right? And the name could be Dullard or the name could be, you know, uh what's 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 worse than a dullard uh, like a moron oh my gosh that's such a harsh word <laughs> so let's stick with dullard okay but you give it a name and not only are all the roles uh, on that stat going to be difficult for him but also you use that word you use the word dullard and actually it might even be in his title his title is like stone toe the dullard this is painful to a player, but also in some ways interesting because it not only does the first uh, thing we mentioned, which is keep it at the surface, it keeps reminding them, it also gives it a name and, and that name can be evoked either by players, NPCs, or you to remind and to mechanify or to uh, statify or gamify this low stat. So whenever the word dullard comes up, he knows that this this low stat is going to be coming into play or is going to be levied in some way. And so you categorize these low stats. You know, uh, a, a classic one too is with low con. You do like sickly and then you do diseased and then you do like a leper and then you do like the stricken, right? And the stricken or the afflicted are these kind of, you know, people who are barely able to move without their remedy. And like, you know, you have a an in-game term for how crippled they are by this low stat. And by using that term, it's like knowing the name of a demon, right? You know its name, you can evoke it. And when it's evoked, it puts images and story and interest, not only into your mind, but into the minds of the players and into the story itself. So that's my first sort of uh, rundown, uh, which is how to make these things interesting. Give them names, make them part of your game, give them an evocation, make them hurt a little more and, and bring them to the surface. That to me is the way that you make dump stats interesting. Now, you don't want to put too much thought and effort into making dump stats interesting because let's face it, players do want to do the things they're best at the most. So you don't want to be grinding them down with all these off stat rolls just to sort of troll them about their low stats. But you also don't want the opposite behavior, which is they can freely have a zero wisdom and it never comes up in play. I think that's the bad case that we're trying to work against here. So that's part one. Make them interesting. 
Okay, part two is compelling. You want to compel the characters to have better overall stats. Now, the method that I normally use to do this is as I'm planning my adventure or I'm setting up rooms and challenges for them to solve in their own ways, I do make a little note to the side of what stat is going to do best in this encounter. You know, what's the key stat? So if you have a high stat of blah, this room is going to be far easier for you. So examples, you have stones in a river. The stones are slippery and covered with moss. You have a little note on the side of this that says dex. Now there's a million ways, you know, a high intelligence character could build a bridge with sticks over this, over this thing, right? But a high dex character is going to have a pretty easy, fast time of hopping across the stones. Okay, that's a really simple example. But remember, we're not working on something like dex. Everyone wants high dex. We're working on stuff like charisma. Okay, so now you can think it backwards, which is stat first and then come up with your room. I know I want a room that pushes charisma, where charisma is going to be useful. Well, what could that be? Well, for charisma really to be useful, you generally need somewhat intelligent enemies or challenges, right? You can't charm the stones in the river. That's not going to work. You can yell at the stones in the river all you want. And uh, unless you have a weirding module, it's not going to come to much, right? But if you have intelligent or semi-intelligent enemies uh, or objects in a room, then charisma and intelligence are going to become useful. So let's just stick with charisma, which is different than intelligence. So you don't want to have to outthink, research, or decode. You want to have to persuade, charm, or resist. Okay, so ooh, those are some interesting words. I like resist. That sounds kind of exciting. So maybe there's a, a, a doorknob that's intelligent, and it can actually persuade you. And with high charisma, you can see that actually this thing is just lying. It, it's... It's not locked at all. And those who think it's locked, like in their reality, it is locked, right? And so the only way that we're going to get past this thing is to resist its force. Now, this is an extremely tiny sort of binary challenge. But what you could have that would be larger scale would be to face a military force, like let's say, you know, uh, dwarven berserkers who've gone mad because they have fungus in their brains and they're yelling at you. And as they yell and do these battle cries, these fungusy battle cries, they're kind of terrifying the way they sound. They're like, you know, and it can make everyone in the group afraid unless you have the force of will to see that it's just fungus making that noise, that these are just dwarves. They can be beaten. Right. And this yell is something that the dwarves are constantly emitting. And so the players are constantly being you know, forced to make this charisma save, not to be afraid of this horrible sound during a combat, throughout a combat. So every round you're saving against this thing and people with low charisma are going to hate it. Another classic one is, you know, overall fear and, and horror as an ongoing theme and charisma becomes the save that you use not to be afraid. And in a, in a horror oriented game, this can really make a low charisma character just, you know, really, um, grinding their teeth. So this is how you compel characters to want diverse stats, is that your gameplay is diverse. Remember, the the, the crummy kind of DMing is rooms that are filled with combatants that have nothing to say that stand still while they make rolls to kill you. (laughs) And then there's another room where the same thing happens and another room where the same thing happens. And that, that's the opposite version. You don't want to be that DM. You want to be the diverse, fascinating, surprising, interesting DM that makes all of the nuance and variability of the game interesting and useful. Remember, this is a game of infinite possibilities. We're not mashing the attack button and seeing a, a pre-created attack animation on a screen. We can do anything in this game. So utilize that freedom by creating vastly diverse challenges and situations. It doesn't always have to be a direct conflict. It's just a situation with an out. You don't even know the outcome. You don't write outcomes. You're a dungeon master. You write questions. You write challenges. So the diversity of those challenges is going to make the the sort of well-rounded character leaning back and laugh in his chair while the fighter we mentioned earlier with no intelligence, he's going to be, you know, uh, face palming. Okay, so we've talked about making the stats interesting. We've talked about compelling the characters. Okay, so now as a final thought, 
I want to I want to give you an idea to make sure that you include at some point in your campaign, in your adventures, in your story, that's gonna round all this out. Okay, so let's say you have your cool solutions, you have some challenges that use diverse stat leaning, um, you've got players who are uh, responding to that, some of them are face palming, some of them are grinning. Now you've got a final piece to make sure that you do to make this design work for them. And that is to provide a chance for correction and adjustment. Now, if all you do is grind a player down because he has a dump stat and you occasionally give him or her increased difficulty or a bit of a face palm moment, well, okay, that's going to compel them. But then if they have no means to adjust their stat set, you're just trolling on something they can't change. You're just reminding them that they're, they have no way to modify their character. So what I would recommend is that as you begin to embrace a more diverse challenge set, you also embrace something new that's going to let characters course correct. So let's say that their early levels, it's all just simple combat, and then you start introducing some of these charisma challenges, and all your characters have low charisma. You're just being a troll if then, if they move into the next sort of chapter, they don't get an opportunity to invest in that stat. So what you need to do is simultaneously escalate your diversity and escalate frequency of stat boosting. Now, yeah, you're going to get more powerful characters as you offer them chances to boost stats, but by letting them have a learning opportunity, they're going to be able to respond in the nuanced and more complex way that you're seeking in them. If they don't get that chance to respond, you know, they don't level up and get a stat boost until like two months from now, then you're being a little bit cruel in the diversification and the detail and widening of your challenge spectrum, right? So as you escalate on that front, make sure that you give a chance. You say, hey, everybody, bump one stat by one point after this session. That was really awesome. Okay. And, you know, hey, Bill, don't don't forget, like you were making terrible intelligence rolls all night. I know you want to put another point in damage, but consider, you know, moving up that silly intelligence problem so people don't call you a dullard anymore. You see, instead of just me making things hard for people, they get a chance to respond in kind and evolve their characters in a way that makes them feel like, oh yeah, I'm up to this new kind of interesting challenge that the DM is bringing to the table. Okay, our next topic is about the dramatic question. Now, if any of you tuned in for my interview with Kelsey Dion last week, um, she's from the Arcane Library, and I, I really loved how she wrote her adventures, but in particular, I loved one element more than anything else. Now, she had a, a brilliant set of tools that she used in her adventures, but I thought the most brilliant was the use of the dramatic question. And it literally just says in her adventure, dramatic question. I mean, it's like it's just a bullet that she has on her adventure for each little portion, like each little sort of room, as we would call it in ICRPG talk, each little space or challenge. She says, what's the question here? A question too can be a terribly simple binary question. Like if your question begins with the word will, you know, will they survive the Kraken? You know, will they defeat the orcs that are in this room? And will they find the chest that's hidden in the mud? That's a yes, no answer on that question. And so as a DM... It isn't tremendously dramatic to ask a yes, no question too many times. Now, a couple of times, absolutely do it. You know, will they blah, 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 or can they blah, blah, blah. Okay, sure. You can ask lots of very simple questions that way. But to mix things up and to give players options and and new choices and really to get more mileage out of the dramatic question creative method, I would encourage you to consider questions like how. How will they survive the Kraken? Now, that's an interesting question. Not will they survive, but how will they survive? And you know, the way that that question is framed, it almost implies that this thing isn't survivable. How are you going to survive the Kraken, dude? Right? It, It implies this thing can't be killed. It destroys entire ships in like one turn. It gets these legendary actions where it's can like, you know, pull islands underwater and all kinds of crazy stuff. So the question becomes, how are you going to defeat the Kraken? Now, you're going to feel a temptation when you ask a how type question. How are they going to find the chest in the swamp? 
right? Which also sort of implies like this chest is very well hidden. Now, the temptation as a storyteller and as just a, a wide-minded person, which dungeon masters are, your instinct might be to provide a multiple choice set of answers. And I would invite you to repel this behavior. So let's stick with the Kraken. How are they going to defeat the Kraken? Okay, well, let me list out four possible solutions. One, uh, find the head of Medusa and turn it to stone. Two, there's actually a nuclear bomb hidden in the Acropolis. Three, there's a giant whirlpool that can be activated with the ritual of the, you know, Cordan. <laughs> and then four, there's a great warrior made of stone who's in the mountains that can be awakened and can battle the Kraken. Okay, so these are four. Now, that's kind of cool. That sounds like a campaign is starting to form around battling the Kraken. But I would invite you to let players answer the question of how. Now, they don't have to derail any kind of thematic or story elements in your campaign. But if you honestly ask them a how question at the end of a session and they start com comprising answers, it gives you your prep phase to answer their their ideas for the next session. Now, you, it's tough to ask a how question at the beginning of a sentence or a session, sorry, the beginning of a session, and truly be honestly asking players for their answer because you have no prep for what they might say. So it's hard to ask a very nuanced question right at the beginning of a session with no preparation of what they might say. And they're like, how are you going to defeat the Kraken? And one of them says, well, in my backstory, there's actually this order of wizards. And I think we should go uh, into the forest and find the order of wizards and ask them how we might defeat the Kraken. You have no prep on any of this kind of stuff. And if you ask that at the beginning of the session, it puts you on the spot a little bit. But if you ask at the end of a session, so the Kraken is appearing out of the ocean and there's like maybe a few days before it reaches land. And you honestly, with no preset answers, ask, how are you going to defeat the Kraken? The players can begin to devise answers and they're truly their answers. And you prepare with the context of their answers, not the stuff that you wanted to happen, but what they wanted to happen. And that's a way to really give players agency in the ways that they answer dramatic questions. Now, dramatic questions can take many, many other forms that are far simpler. You know, will they survive the poison gas that comes out of the wall in this corridor? That can be a dramatic question. So, well, that implies most of the design that I need in, in my, uh, my room, my corridor, without me even really having to write anything down. Uh, and then I start wondering, hmm, how does the poison gas triggered? How is it disabled? And what are its sort of statistical pieces of information? That's three little bullets I need and I'm about ready to go. How big is the corridor and stuff like that, right? The questions that a player will answer or will ask, I probably need to answer as far as, you know, physical detail. But then you could also have far stranger dramatic questions. You know, like, is, is the goblin who he says he is? Well, that implies he's not, right? But this is you asking yourself questions as a dungeon master. And so now you have some interesting stuff going on there. Well, first of all, why is there deception happening? Second of all, how? How is he being deceptive? Is he lying? Is he in disguise? Is he hidden? Is he, you know, using a like a voice modulator from another room and pretending to be a powerful wizard? You know, like, well, who is this goblin? What is this? And all these little interesting tidbits are coming out of your first dramatic question. And so I just wanted everyone to entertain the idea of utilizing this question method because I really think it's brilliant. And I have not used that. This is new to me. And so I started using it um, working on my adventure for the uh, ICRPG group, which we're playing Wednesday, um, which is a sort of an alternate Vietnam uh, one shot where some crazy stuff goes down. And I use the sort of question method and right away I realized, wow, this is powerful. Um, not only because it helps me, you know, get my rusty brain gears turning, but also gives me unexpected answers and tidbits and possibilities based on answering questions for myself. And then the final level was like, whoa, what if I ask some of these open-ended questions of players? And they're honestly open-ended and players can actually have all this agency and whoa, and so I wanted to share it with you guys because for me as a discovery, it was absolutely fantastic. And I really, uh, I owe a mug of gar to um, Kelsey Dion. So hopefully I can bump into her at Gen Con or something and, and we can buy her a beer because hell yeah. <laughs>
And if you haven't checked it out, two of her adventures that I really like are Secrets of Skyhorn Lighthouse and The Fires of Isk. So check those babies out on the DMs Guild. Um, good stuff. Okay, so we've talked about dump statting and a little bit of deep think on that stuff. We've talked about the dramatic question, uh, how it can be used and, and how it can up your adventure writing game. And now I want to hit you with a really crazy one called adventure inversion or concept inversion. Whoa. You know me, I like to put cool names on things like room design. <laughs> um, adventure inversion, concept inversion. Okay, so a lot of times when I'm coming up with the next adventure, a one shot or what's going to happen next, basically, or what, you know, what series of challenges is going to come based on what the players said last time and this, that and the other thing. Often at that moment, I'm just kind of like, uh, <laughs> for, for several frightening minutes, I'm just basically, um, uh, maybe there's, um. There's like a guy with a sharp stick or something, or I don't know, right? And I'm, I'm in this sort of swamp of idea creation. And it isn't like refining and completing my idea. It's actually just spawning an idea out of pure ether, right? And that to me is always the toughest moment. So I employed this inversion concept, and um, I want to share it with you guys because it worked out great for me. So if you've ever noticed playing a lot or DMing a lot, a lot of sessions follow a similar pattern, which is that you have the kind of the on the road, um, entering the area, uh, climactic battle, uh, mystery revealed, and boss fight, right? I, I know that that's oversimplification, but if you, if you take a hard look at a lot of the gameplay that you're doing at your table, I think you'll see this pattern emerging quite a bit because it's a natural storytelling structure. I mean, it's kind of, you know, hero's journey type, you know, screenwriting kind of staple technique, right? Escalate the adventure, push it to a, a higher level, you know, un, un, unveil the crazy or, you know, provide a twist and then go in for the final confrontation, right? This is like age old, tried and true goodness. So what I did on this exercise as I was writing this adventure is I just inverted the entire thing. I just straight up inverted it. So if you draw out your usual night of adventure, no matter what it is, whatever set of challenges you tend to do as an accidental or intentional pattern in your adventure design or your session design, write that out in four or five little nodes. Then right underneath, just reverse the nodes. So in this case, it would be boss fight, mystery revealed, climactic battle, entering the area, and then fight on the road. That's the inverted version. So this is what I did to get started. And right away, I just had so many questions. Well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to put this here? And But those are the questions that are going to lead me down to the creative completion of the idea. It's, it's the initiation of questions that is so hard creatively, but once they start flowing, it, it's just a matter of how you can briefly and succinctly answer all those questions that are popping up in your mind. Now, if you want to take inversion to even another level, you can invert the normal event flow with your little flow chart, right? On your piece of paper, then use your ICRPG cards and draw them at random for those nodes. And this is where you really start to get some weird questions. Like what? My boss fight, my boss fight is, is a corridor? My mystery revealed is, is a minotaur? What does that even mean? You know, what? huh? My climactic battle is a, a jug of wine? What, what is that? But it's okay. You don't need the card to explain everything to you. All you need the card to do is kick you upside the head to get your gears turning, to knock the bolts out of your skull, right? And then once the skull is going and working, you don't need the card anymore. It's asking interesting and unexpected questions. That's what random draw of images and concepts can do for you, as well as inversion. Inversion itself isn't going to create ingenious adventures for you, but what it is going to do is kick you upside the head with your expectations, and getting you asking how to questions rather than what will I do questions. What will I do is a really tough question to answer. You can do anything within the, the scope of the story or with you know player decisions from last session or whatever. And, and when you can do anything, it's so hard to answer that question. What should I do? That's too much like real life, right? You can do almost anything. You have a lot of freedom in life. And it's really hard to find the answer of what should I do with my life? <laughs> you don't want all that difficulty just for writing an adventure. <laughs> so this is where sometimes drawing ICRPG cards can provide you with some root level concepts to get that brain turning. 
And especially with inversion and then matching up the the sort of story moments with these cards and stuff, and you, you get the brain turning in a creative fashion. So, hey, give a try to inversion. Give it a try, you know? And if you normally plot your adventures out by um, stat checks, like we were talking about earlier, right? This is a sort of a strengthy room. And this is a dexterity kind of focused room. And then I have my sort of charisma focused encounter. Invert that. So your charisma counter comes first. Your dex one is still in the middle. And then the strengthy one is your final encounter, right? That's opposite of your normal behavior. And then, well, what are those things? And either just come up with them based on the context of your current adventure or draw some cards or roll dice, whatever you like to do. Roll those cool dungeon setting dice or roll on tables, which is kind of the ab tab method, right? You get out your Oath of the Frozen King, you know your nodes, and then you roll for what those nodes may be. You know, it's like a trap room is my strength encounter. Um, A big battle is my charisma encounter. Oh, that's kind of weird. Okay, interesting. And so on and so on and so on. So I, I just want to entertain that idea of we have questions to use, dramatic questions. We have inverting our normal pattern to use as a tool. And we have compelling characters to use their dumped stats. So between all these things, you already have a lot of work to do on your next adventure. Those are a lot of buckets to fill. And you may not do all three in one adventure or one session, but you might. And uh, as always, the point of the RPG mainframe is to look for these methods that can sort of knock you upside the head creatively, get things moving. And also, I hope you guys see RPG Mainframe is about talking about the specifics of the creative challenge of making tabletop gameplay, not debating rules or uh, discussing the history of this, that, or other thing, or going off with opinion. I I try to avoid those things on the podcast and really make it about the nuts and bolts of what we do every week and methods and content that are going to directly find their way into your creative method and into your next game. So I hope that you guys are feeling what I'm feeling on that because everything I discussed for this podcast was critical for my creation of this sort of alternate Vietnam adventure that we're going to run on Wednesday. So this isn't just being spoken from a point of uh, ethereal theory. Ethereal theory? That is horrible. (laughs) Don't put that on a bumper sticker because that is a dumb phrase. (laughs) Man, I like that theory, but it sure is ethereal. It's a little bit of non-material materialism if you get my meaning. All right. Okay. Hey, well, that's RPG Mainframe for this week. That is episode 15, and I am trying my darndest to get um, a Burning in New Haven part five completed. So I had a few ideas, and I think I'm going to get back to the writing desk soon on that. Um so keep your eyes peeled and keep it real and you always get a good deal okay it's hank Fernell signing off for the rpg mainframe y'all have a have a good week and uh, i'll see you on the internets all right strength honor and oh what's that over there beer sand squid look out (laughs) 